especially like for women, like once you form a, form an emotional bond with us, I think you'd be surprised at how much fucking weird in quotes shit we're willing to do. Uh uh-huh. You know, that's uh-huh. just a little, a little when we secret, feel safe, a little wink, wink from me to you, yeah, my yeah, friend. Yeah. <laughs> when we feel safe with you, any holes up for when grabs. We feel- what up, fuckers? How you doing? Where you been? Wear a condom. Welcome to another episode of Guys We Fucked. It's the anti slut shaming podcast. I'm Corinne Fisher. I'm Christina Hutchinson. Welcome to the show. Make we sure. have so many shows. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you're in New York City, February 1st, which is a Thursday, Corinne and I are doing uh, Guys We Fucked live at the MasterCard Midnight Theater, the first one of 2024. It's going to be a hoot. If you've been to any of these shows or you've watched the live stream, you know we ain't lying. Okay. It's so fun. And then in Los Angeles, February 14th. Yes, it's Valentine's Day. Yes, it's, you know what? You're in luck. Doesn't matter if you got a partner or not. You're gonna come to our show at the Comedy Store. We're headlining the main room. We're doing a Guys We Fucked show in the main room. It's already half sold out. So make sure you buy your tickets. You can get them anywhere. Uh, Our social media bios are a great place. At Guys We Fucked without the U and Fucked across all platforms. I'm at Christina Hutch. I'm at Philanthropy Gal. And I'm at Mike Coscarelli. Or yeah. You can also just go to the websites. You can Google them. You can, there's so many places it's you can accessible. get tickets. It's all, it's very, very. Uh, if you want to email us, the sub, uh, the email address rather is sorry about last night's show at gmail.com. Today's subject line, a lactation lover's journey to intimacy. Oh, mm. I love that for you. Dear Corinne and Christina, and of course, Mike. I subscribe to Luminary just to listen to you guys, and I'm reaching out to you today to share a personal aspect of my story in the hopes that it might resonate with some of your listeners. I hope that by sharing my experiences, uh, I can gain valuable insights and advice from you both. As a 27-year-old male from Saudi Arabia, I've always been captivated by the unique intimacy and nurturing nature of lactation. This is not where I thought this was going. Uh, The act of providing sustenance and care has always been deeply arousing to me. Mm. And I've been fortunate enough to experience this with a few women who have been open to this kind of connection. However, I found that it's becoming increasingly difficult to find partners who are comfortable with this form of intimacy as I've grown older. The longing for this particular connection has left me feeling lonely and yearning for a deeper bond with someone. In my pursuit of intimacy, I've turned to booking sex workers, not for sexual services, but for the opportunity to cuddle and be close to another person. I understand that this might be considered a taboo topic, nah, but I believe that the essence of your podcast lies in addressing the unconventional and sometimes uncomfortable aspects of sex and relationships. You are correct, sir. As a fan of your show, I'm eager to hear your thoughts and advice on how to approach this topic with potential partners without coming across as strange or fetishistic. I found that the subject can be challenging to bring up and I worry about the impact it may have on my chances of forming a serious relationship. Furthermore, I'm interested in hearing your perspectives on the ethics of booking sex workers for companionship uh, as I believe it's a complex and controversial issue that warrants open discussion. No, I think it's completely normal to book a sex worker just to hug you. A hundred percent. It makes total sense to me. Yeah, it's your it's your Honestly, personal no, choice. And that sex worker will probably be amped. Yeah, my, um, my concern would just be making sure that you like can set up a boundary for yourself where you don't then accidentally fall in love with a sex worker who is literally just doing their job and does mm. not feel the same way about you. I think it's like, I, I, I think that's the, the only danger there. Mm, but as long as totally. you, you're clear on, on the boundaries that exist within the reality that you're both living in, then I think it's totally fine. Yeah. That's why sex workers, I think to me, that's like the primary reason why sex workers should be exist and, and it should be legal yeah. because of companionship. Yes, intimacy, emotional intimacy and physical intimacy is so value, valuable yeah. for a person's like mental and, and physical health. I'm going to go out there and say it. Absolutely. This journey has led me to question whether I am emotionally prepared prepared for a committed relationship or if I should seek therapy, uh, first seek therapy to address this need in a healthier way. I appreciate your honesty and openness in discussing various topics and I would love to hear your perspective on my situation. I want to express uh, my gratitude for your work in fostering a space for open and genuine conversations about sex and sexuality. Your podcast has helped me feel less alone. Yay. And I'm informed about my own desires and I'm confident that your insights will be valuable to others as well. Thank you for your time and consideration. Well, what a lovely lactation email. email. Also, dude, 
I, 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 you're 27 props to you. You are a 27 year old man who knows himself. That mm. is beautiful. That is sexy. That to me is masculinity. That's humanity, but also like a man who knows himself and knows what he wants and get and, and seeks it out in places, you know, like, like going to a sex worker to kind of experience emotional intimacy. Yeah. I think that's very wise decision and yeah. good on you for putting your needs first. I think that you will actually be a very good partner to somebody one day. Um, here, here. And also in expressing your, like the lactation thing, I think if you, you should definitely talk about it with potential partners, because if it makes them run away, then maybe that's not your potential partner. Although I know some people that have like, um, these more niche sexual desires, yeah. um, that they cannot, that their partner is not a space for them to act those out, that they kind of prefer to act it out with like a sex worker. Um, obviously it's discussed between both partners uh, before that happens. I don't know if that's necessarily something that fall, like your personal desire falls under this category, but if you're going to have a conversation about it, which I think you should, after you've like really kind of get to know the person and you feel like there might be a spark there, talk about the emotional impact that this activity has on you mm -hmm. and, and the satisfaction it brings you first before you talk about what it actually is. And I think that's a great way of easing in. Yeah, I think when you talk about how you're, you state, like as you've gotten older, this has been harder to find partners open to this. Like, well, first of all, it made me laugh because you're only 27. So what do you mean as you've gotten older? <laughs> like how, like what what bracket of time are we talking about here? But anyway, um, I, I think that the only issue is if you are leading with the lactation, because yeah. then to me, that's where the fetishistic mentality comes in and where women, especially like modern women, will start to question what their role is in your life. Like, am I just a, like a vessel for lactation or am I primarily a person who you writer is interested in? And then secondarily, uh, this is a person who is sexually interested in, you know, and in, in, from an intimacy perspective, interested in lactation. And that is something I am willing to do with him because of our deep connection and how kind he is and how he gets me on other levels. So mm -hmm. like, yeah, I, I agree with Christina. Like you definitely have to come, have to have a conversation with it, but I also agree that like, I don't think this is something that we're talking about on dates one or two. No. You know, you 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 voice concern that you think this is going to stop you from being able to have a long term relation, serious relationships, which to me just put, sent off a little alarm that says you, you're you're. It seems like you might be prioritizing the lactation in a in a way that feels like mm. you're fiending for it, right? Yeah. And that's a, that's only a question that you can answer for yourself. Like, is this at the forefront of your mind at all times? Is this the main thing you're thinking about on a date? Like, when can I get to that lactation Give me part? that titty. Because then to me, it is something that has to be discussed with a therapist. This should not be overtaking your mind, nor should this be the primary, like if the primary thing you are looking for with a partner when you're seeking a relationship uh, with a partner, then you're not, it is like a sexual thing. Then you're not seeking a relationship. You're seeking a sexual uh, interaction. And and women can sense that, right? Mm -hmm. we, we don't want to be used. It is a kink to be used as Unless a fuck toy. Unless we feel like being used as right? a fuck toy, which sometimes we do, but we'll make that clear, okay? Okay. Right. Or, and then you're going to go on a different kind of website. You're not going to go yeah. on hinge to use someone like a fuck toy. You're going to no. go on field or, or, or something, you know, something a little bit less traditional. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so those are the things that those are some of these questions are questions that you only know the answer to yourself. Like, I think like it's a good thing to bring up in therapy if you're already in therapy, but like, yeah, if this is like as, as a main concern in your life, as maybe it seems from this email, then yeah, you need to go to therapy to learn how to use this as a part of your relationship and a part of connecting with someone, not your whole life not is about course. lactation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your yeah, whole yeah. life shouldn't Ain't be nobody gonna like about that. anything sexual. Even a baby's whole life right. isn't about lactation. Yeah. Just the first couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Because I think like once you form a bond with someone, especially like for women, like once you form, a, form an emotional bond with us, I think you'd be surprised at how much fucking weird, in quotes, shit we're willing to do. Uh uh-huh. You know, that's uh -huh. just a little, a little when we secret, feel safe, a little wink, wink from me to you, yeah, my yeah, friend. Yeah. <laughs> when we feel safe with you, any holes up for grabs When we feel sometimes. safe, loved, and adored. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. 
hundred oh, percent. Shit, you want us to you want us to get us to do something that you don't know if we would do. You can put on that diaper and act like a baby. We'll, we're going to be down, yeah. like for real. Yeah, like, I heard a comic talking about that. Uh, interestingly enough, about that he has that kink, and I'm like, yeah, I bet like your wife is going to do that with you because she loves you. She loves you, and she does feel safe. And it seems like you have been a good partner. Yeah, to her. and she and likes. So that's why it wasn't weird when you brought it up. Yeah, and when and when you love your partner, you it's exciting to do something that turns them on, even if it doesn't turn you on. Right, as long as it doesn't turn you off. Exactly, it's an exploration. Speaking of explorations, um, well, real quick, we can go through. Uh, we have other shows in addition to February so 1st. Many shows. In New York City on February 14th. February 9th and 10th, I am headlining Bananas in New Jersey, right across the river from New York City. And then um, yours is And then right February 29th through March 2nd, I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the D.C. Comedy Loft with Chloe LeBranch. That, those tickets have been on sale for a while, so uh, those are kind of uh, going quickly. And if you want to get a ticket, I I would, you know, now's the time to really pull the trigger on that. And March 22nd through the 23rd, I'm going to be headlining the Blue Room in Springfield, Missouri. Um, never been. T- I heard that's a great club. Yeah, I heard it's a great club too by a couple other comics. I don't know. Have we ever been in Missouri? Uh, I don't think I've ever been there. Yeah, we've been to St. Louis. Oh, right. That is Missouri. <laughs> show me your uh, coastal leaders well show me your coastal yeah we went to so, I mean um, I've been there at least uh, one, time, one time I might have been by myself but I've definitely I've been there at least twice I fucking and love and once was definitely with you yeah yeah yeah, yeah cause yeah I remember St. Louis um, in the arch somebody mm-hmm. farted on the ride up yeah. it was awful oh, I'll, never for, I'll never forget that smell <laughs> fuck you sir fuck yeah, you I know who you are that was pretty rough it was really bad but um, I love tiny towns I just love them when I did uh, Utah what the fuck? Where was I in Utah? I flew into Salt Lake, but I went to some other Pro, town. Like by the Provo schools? Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it was awesome. I love a small town. They're so fascinating. And honestly, you guys deserve comedy more. And it's more fun to yeah. do comedy for you guys. So please come out. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, there's an article kind of in the spirit of... Um, of helping people um, and giving them knowledge and a heads up before they find themselves in terrible situations. I came across this article that uh, piqued my uh, curiosities. Uh, It's written by this private, uh, oh, it's about hiring a private investigator, but the article is called, Is My Partner Living a Double Life? Five Warning Signs. And I just wanted to share these with you guys just in case. Um, what Can't wait living, to see the emails. What does living a double life mean? If someone's living a double life, it means they are leading two very distinct lives and keeping one hidden from the other. The secret life may include an extramarital affair, a second spouse or family, an addiction, uh, shopping, stealing, or gambling, sometimes resulting in debt or legal trouble. Well, I know a lot of people that have had partners like that. Illegal activities such as drug dealings, a secret job, i.e. working as an escort. Um, and then he, these are the five, how can you tell if someone lives a double life? Well, here's some five signs, boys and girls and they's and thems. Let me know if uh, you're in the market for some matrimonial surveillance. Um, often they're away from home. If your partner spends a long day away from home, this is because this can be cause for suspicion. For example, they can take regular weekends away for work or family reasons and never invite you along. Uh, two, they have unusual boundaries. Refusing... Oh, it's healthy to have boundaries in relationships, but does your partner set limits that seem extreme or unreasonable? For example, refusing to add you on social media. That always struck me as weird because I still know people that are in relationships that they don't follow each other, but it's not, be, it's not, they don't live a career where they have to be on social media. So it's not like a separate thing. Right. And I'm like, mm, that's, that's so flag. weird. It's weird. It's weird. Uh, not allowing you to meet their family, friends, or colleagues. That's a big one. Uh, being unwilling to discuss certain topics such as their past or finances. Uh, Number three, their stories don't add up. People living a double life weave complex webs of lies and sometimes forget what they've said to whom. They share many details about their past uh, that differ from what they've told you previously. Maybe they've changed their story about where they were last week, or perhaps their spending habits don't uh, match the job and salary they claim to have. Four, they're extremely protective of their devices. Mm. That's very true. Insist on privacy when using their phone or computer. They turn off the screen when you enter the room. Mm, I've had that happen. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then you know that's all I'm thinking about all day and night and week and the rest of our relationship. Regularly delete their emails, text messages, and browsing history. Mm, I've also had that happen. Refuse to let you, u- they weren't living a double life. They were probably just cheating, uh, which I guess is double life according to this. Refuse to let you use their phone for any reason. 
I always use that as a test when I start dating somebody. I'm like, hey, can I see your phone to put on this song real quick? Just to see if they, I'm not going to look, but just to see if they freak out. Well, that's weird. I, 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 I like fucking hate when people use my phone, but I'm not, I'm not hiding anything. I just hate it. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Like, like if we're both driving and I want to change your song. Yeah. Cause I had one time I was in the car. Who was I dating at the time? Somebody, somebody older. Um, we were in the car. He was driving. I remember, fuck, who was it? And I wanted to change the song and I just went up and he goes, I'll change it. And I was like, what the fuck, dude? Was this like I, in recent years? This was oh. like four years ago, maybe oh. Five, like in between Steven and Colin. Um, but I, it made me go, I, I didn't, it wasn't even invested in this person that much. So I remember going, oh, I don't want to date you anymore. Like this is, that's good enough for me. I don't right. need, I don't even know what you're doing, but I'm fine. Right. Um, and then five, they avoid simple questions. Often someone living a double life will avoid basic questions such as- Are you living a been- double life? What <laughs> 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 oh, kind of allergies? Is it hot in here? <laughs> um, uh, such as where they've been or what they've been doing, which, uh, you know, uh, use all of these points with a grain of salt because it's a, there's certain situations I'd be like, don't fucking ask me where I was. And I was not leading a double life. Right. They may give you vague answers, change the subject, or may make you feel guilty for asking. That's the one that I agree with. If they make you feel guilty for asking- Mm, I don't know. Unless you're truly, you know, Unless you're possessive. just a fucking nagging bitch. Yeah, don't be a <laughs> nagging cunt. Don't be a fucking and nagging bitch. And that's any bitch. gender. Any gender could be a nagging bitch. Absolutely. Guys oh, be man. fucked. Guys be fucked. Don't be a nagging bitch. All right, and that brings us to uh, another article that we wanted to share on the show today. This has to do with our guest. Um, our guest uh, wrote a book about being single at heart, and we're going to get into that in a second. But in her book, which is right here, being single at heart, she references this Washington Post article that says uh, called "Normal Marital Hatred Is Real." Here's what to do about it. Uh, that came out in September of 2022 by Tara Parker Pope, and so I was like, "Oh, I bet I can pull up this article today and share it with you guys," because the author uh, of "Single at Heart" was just pointing out how strange she thought it was to write an article about marriage in which one of the tips was that it's okay t- to hate your spouse. So she, ah. she said, she said, I think, thought that was a little weird. Yes, that is fucking weird. So anyway, it says normal marital hatred is real. Here's what to do about it. No relationship is perfect. Try to start thinking <laughs> of yours as an ecosystem that you share with someone else. Or don't get married. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Do you know what normal marital hatred is? If you've been married or in a long-term relationship, then you probably do. No. (laughs) I've been, you didn't experience this with Steven? At the end, that's why I dumped him. Yeah. I was like, wait, I hate you. So we broke up. Yeah. 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 I've been talking about this around the uh, country for decades, said Terrence Real, a best-selling author and family therapist who offers couples workshops. Not one person has ever come backstage and said, what do you mean by that? Everybody knows what it is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> marriage. Eh. <laughs> Damn. Even so, <laughs> the idea that hating your romantic partner is normal may come as a bit of a shock to those who have idealized romantic relationships. Yeah, I feel this in most times in a relationship and that's when I also end it. Yeah. And I know that like seemingly society is telling us that for a relationship to go to the distance, you need to like get Work past through that? that part. Nah, you don't. But I can't. And nor should I, you. I hate them. You shouldn't work and past I, that. And I don't want to be around them anymore. Ever. Yeah. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do know. Ugh. It's called How I Know I Need to Break It Off. <laughs> That's yeah. what this article should be called. When just like the sound of their fork hitting the plate makes you want to end their life. <laughs> <laughs> totally. One I hope this car ride you're about to go on is your last. <laughs> what? I didn't say that. Right? One conversation with real and you will be cured of any notion that real life looks like a rom-com. No one acknowledges the- It does when you're single. (laughs) (laughs) No one acknowledges the underbelly of relationships, said real author of Us, getting past you and me to build a more loving relationship. Nobody acknowledges the darkness. (laughs) 
damn girl. This is, this is rough. Relationship experts have tried for years to unlock the mystery of how couples resolve conflict and learn to stay together. John Gottman, a University of Washington marriage researcher, pioneered the study of relationships by recording couples during conflict and monitoring positive and negative words, facial expressions, and body language. He calculated that strong relationships have a five to one ratio of positive to negative interactions. Another researcher, retired University of Virginia professor E. Mavis Hetherington, Whoa. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Studied 1,400 heterosexual couples over three decades and found a type of marriage most prone to divorce. She called it the pursuer distancer marriage, in which one person typically presses to solve problems, but the other dismisses the concerns. So every marriage? <laughs> real said he thinks the real problem is that many couples, if I was writing about someone with the last name Real, I would have tried to avoid using real. Um, Correct. A, it's very confusing. More often, just, you know, <laughs> hey, who am I? But just point that out there. Um, you know, you're a writer. <laughs> like, you could have easily said real, th- th- he said he thinks the main problem is, yeah. the underlying problem is, anyway, but whatever, um, is that many couples turn conflict into a power struggle and nobody wins. In normal circumstances, if you're unhappy with me, that is not the time for me to talk to you about how unhappy I am with you, he said. Everybody gets that wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Including me. Whoopsies. It's so hard not to. Now that you bring that up. (laughs) It's so hard not to. It's really hard. Because when someone brings up something wrong with you, you go, I, I've been sitting on this shit for years. I've just been sitting here tolerating your behavior. I didn't know that I could simply present it to you as a laundry list the moment I felt a tinge of unhappiness. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, love. Anyway, so here's what you should know about normal marital hatred and what you can do about it. <laughs> In bold, it's okay to hate your partner. No, it's not. There are going to be moments when you look at your partner and at that moment, there is a part of you that just hates their guts, Real said. You're trapped with this horrible human being. How did you wind up here? (laughs) What I want to say is welcome to marriage. Welcome to long-term relationships. What are, where was this published? The Washington Post. Stop. Yeah. But don't despair. He said, the question is now what? Divorce. How do I deal with it? Just get divorced, dude. Then in bold again, stop idealizing relationships. And get divorced. Real notes that we wrongly celebrate an idealized version of commitment, like that cute couple we see at a party who seem to have a perfect relationship. Never seen that. Um, <laughs> where is that They're either from? toxically all over each other or they're talking to other people. What, what, is, what is this, a party you saw on TV? Like what, yeah. I've never been to a real party where I saw this. Um, Just once at a cocktail party, I wish someone would say, there's Harry and Shirley. For the first 20 years, they fought like cats and dogs. He actually left her for a year and took up with another woman. Well, I mean, at comics parties, this happens all the time. Yeah, this is reality. Then they managed to work on it and settle down, and now they're pretty okay. Aren't they adorable? That sounds like the worst description, and if I knew all the backstory for Harry and Shirley, I would never respect a word out of either of those fucking losers' mouths. (laughs) You know, I would go, oh, wow. They both love getting abused. Yeah. Um, And now in bold, it says normal marriages are are long-term partnerships or long-term partnerships are not happy all the time. Well, I mean that, of course. Yeah. After four decades of counseling couples, Real has seen that all relationships follow a consistent cycle, harmony and closeness, disruption and repair and a return to closeness. This Mm. pattern of closeness, disruption and returning to closeness can play out at the micro level 20 times in the course of one dinner conversation. Uh, Oh God. That sounds exhausting. Oh my God. It can also play out over the macro level over decades, he said. Your yeah, relationship- low self-esteem. Yeah, this is- This is for people with low self-esteem. This is for people who- They're trying to fill the hole in their heart with another person. I mean- That's ju- why they hate their spouse. Like just seemingly these people can't think outside the box. Yeah. Your relationships is an ecosystem. Real said traditional therapy, which can teach us to assert ourselves, set the record straight, set boundaries and push back can actually add to this dysfunction of marriages. <laughs> Setting boundaries? <laughs> Yeah, because then then you're going to be distant from me, Christina, and I love you. Come close so I can hit you. (laughs) He knows people don't always like to hear it, but it's healthier to start thinking of your relationship as an ecosystem where any disruption hurts you just as much or worse than it affects your partner. Uh, Worse? That's codependent. I mean- That's codependent. I understand this, like, for instance, like, 
if someone like, because I date a lot of people in the public eye. So like if someone in the is hurting my partner in the public eye, like, uh, yeah, I'll say, you know, even, if I don't, if, even if I agree with the trolls, why, you know, <laughs> I will always Stand have my man. partner's back. But, and, and many times I do feel like maybe that, yeah, that I, watching someone get hurt in that way can hurt me more than perhaps it even hurts them. Mm, yeah, because I you love them. I understand that, like in the protectiveness, but not like, you know, like if they lose their job, I mean, that's, that's, probably, gonna, you, boo. that's probably gonna hurt them. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. That's I'm Especially working. Especially you, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I got that paper. To that, I would say, I mean, were you acting at work the way you act at home? Because then put maybe more of your all into it. Yeah. You know, or did you get laid off? Yeah, it's all circumstantial. Yeah, stop thinking like two individuals and start thinking ecologically. See, this that is where terrible. You, this is where you always lose me with relationships, yeah, yeah, yeah. society. Uh, your relationship is your biosphere. You're not above it. You're in it. You breathe it. Oh, oh my God. That sounds terrible. I've actually lost oxygen. It's I need so, the mask to drop. It's so important for you. If you guys have different opinions, it's so important to express them. And then that you can figure out like, how do you, which one, like, do we compromise or do we not? Like it's, right. wow. And we get into this in, in the interview with our guest today, but this biosphere that we're talking about, like, you know, we, we were talking about the concept of uh, unmarried and childless people, women uh, being so mm. often called selfish by society. But to me, if you are describing your home life as a biosphere, what is You're more happy. fucking selfish than that? Your family is your biosphere? I mean, Ugh. that is like you're you're existing completely on your own, and, it, and like the rest of society doesn't matter because you found your tribe. Oh, you right. Know? I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Once you realize that it's in your self interest to help your partner feel better, it's easier to de escalate conflict. I mean, yeah, that's what I'm always doing. I go, oh, I guess I got to make sure he feels good so my day isn't ruined. <laughs> well, yeah, every woman's been there. Every heterosexual woman's been there. We all know what this is like. <laughs> Save the constructive conversation for later. <laughs> it's my old last relationship. When you're both open to listening instead of in the middle of a fight. People already don't like him. I got to make sure he's less cranky. Yep. Oh my God. Mm. This is not the time to say, well, let me tell you about all my issues with you. Everybody mm. gets that wrong, Real said. Put objective reality aside. Totally. Seems like we're putting all reality yeah. aside. <laughs> this article. If you want to get married, put all reality aside. Okay. <sighs> yeah. Enter into your partner's subject, uh, subjective experience with compassion and curiosity. Yeah. Say, I'm sorry you feel that. Is there anything I could say or do that would help you feel better? So now I got to tell you how to make me feel better? Uh, oh, that's so annoying. Oh, I just want boy. you to do something that's helpful. Boy, boy, boy. I would hate if my partner asked me that. Yeah, Real said it can be a tough pill to swallow, especially when you think your partner is in the wrong. But helping your partner get to an emotionally better place is the best way to protect the ecosystem. See, I disagree That's happy with this wife, on a, happy life shit. Yeah, I disagree with this on a fundamental level yes. because I've had so many partners um, who are, are in a bad mood because they- are fucking in another realm and not in the cool spiritual way, in a way where they think they are much like more talented than oh, they are. right, their version of Or reality. that they are a much harder worker than they are. And mm. listen, I'm not saying my approach where I tell them, where I ask them questions like, what makes you think What's you deserve problem? that with the amount of work you've done is a good way. Yeah, you might want to be a little more gentle. I don't think that was good, but I certainly don't think like contributing to their fantastical view of themselves and the world in which they're not really participating is helpful. Like, yeah, that's called enabling them yeah. towards less reality. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And I feel like that's like how mo like so many people see that as a good wife, one who just like cosplays the, the world that you have created for yourself where you're really talented. Oh God, that sounds terrible. Like, or you're fucking killing it or you've put in, you know, 20 years of work towards stand up comedy or whatever you're pursuing is. Yeah. And when you haven't, which I, is also a slap in the face to me, totally. who, ha who has, is in the same industry. I, you know what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of a lot of men that I've known all throughout my child, like yeah. just men, like family friend men. Yeah. And that whole happy, I've always heard the phrase happy wife, happy life. And I always knew that that was fucked up. I'm like, no, yeah. cause the guys that I witnessed personally say that were miserable and their wives, some of their wives were just, just 
they were so miserable and they like got off on making their husband miserable or something about that. And like all the poor husband was just going on trying to make sure the wife was okay so that he could have a kind of good time, right. which in reality was probably a fucking terrible time. He would have been way happier single. And it's like, yeah, we got to undo these tropes. Well, and also when it's happy wife, happy life, that's me saying you're just doing anything to appease your wife. Your wife so don't respect you. None of Boo. your, yeah, none of your real feelings or needs are being expressed in the yeah. relationship. Yeah, fuck I, that. I also, so I always had a problem with happy wife, happy life. I That's remember so bad. growing up, my neighbor across the street kind of said that. I don't think he said it to me. I think he, like, you know, I, I heard the adults talking because I always used to be like, what's going on up there? Yeah, you yeah, know? it's way more interesting. And, uh, and I just remember thinking to myself as like, I don't know, a nine-year-old? Like, yeah. Are, is, what's this doesn't going seem like a good deal. Yeah. <laughs> what's going on in that house? Free you know? yourselves, gents. Yeah, my dad certainly never said anything like that, nor, nor did my mom. Um Real cautions that this advice is helpful for managing the normal arguments and disruptions that occur in every relationship. Is that it does not apply to abusive situations? Well, thank That's God. Good. Or relationships in which there is a power imbalance, major psychiatric disorder. Okay, well I've. I think I've had that uh, addiction <laughs> or another issue that may require putting your own safety first and seeking professional help. Mm. Learn how to repair. Real said successful couples learn how to talk to each other during and after conflict. Instead of saying, don't talk to me like that, Real suggests something closer to, I want to hear what you have to say. So could you speak to me differently so I can hear it? Can uh, you imagine trying, but can you imagine trying to scream that? Yeah. <laughs> right? I want to hear what you have to say, but if you could speak to me in a little bit different of a tone so I could process it and not get triggered. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, sometimes it's just word economy. Don't talk to me like that. It's yeah. so much better. Yeah, I've said that before. I said it the other day. Yeah. I said, don't tell me what to do. Yeah. If yeah. I want to rage out on this car. Yeah. Let me be an idiot. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I get it. I mean, I guess you I, I guess you could, sh like, I, I've definitely said to someone, like, when they're, like, screaming or having, like, some kind of a meltdown, I've been, like, I've said, like, I'm on your side. I've oh, said that's that. nice. That's a nice thing to say. Because like, that'll melt them, honestly, pretty quickly. I li like, this was happening to me, like, not that long ago. Like, someone called, and they were, like, having, like, just, like, a big, and I, and I, and I was just, like, like, I was, like, you, you called me because I'm on your side. Like, I'm on your side. And I, that's a mm. reminder, like, that's why you called me. You know that, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want both partners, like in life, you know, I'm on your, I'm on your side in life. That doesn't mean just because someone's on your side in life doesn't mean that they're going to agree with every ridiculous choice that you make or Correct. thing that you do. And like, I mean, if that's Nor the kind of they. love that you want, then I mean, that's codependent. Don't come to Corinne. I think we all learned that over yeah. the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, come to Christina. <laughs> I want both partners where we got everything, we got everything you want here at the guys we fuck market. Yeah, a little bit of this, a little, little, little bit of that. Um, I want both partners to be fully voiced, but you have to do it skillfully. He said, people have to learn to speak up for themselves and be loving at the same time. Nobody knows True. how to do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Then it says, discover real intimacy, real set. Like with all this talking, I just don't know how they're still fucking. And that's like the main <laughs> thing I'm grappling with in this. I just don't know, like- Oh, okay. How do you have time to fuck? Not even time. How do you have the want to fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're emotionally depleted, I imagine, by all these conversations. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Sometimes you just got to shut up and fuck. Ugh. Real said we all long for a perfect relationship, but real intimacy actually happens when we- It's like she went out Dude, of her yeah, way to use the word real. <laughs> I'm just going to oh, say- Oh, a woman wrote this? Yeah. Oh, she went out of her way to use I real. A man wrote it. Um, and like, I don't know, maybe like, there's no accent mark. Cause I'm like, maybe the last name is like real, but there's no accent mark. It just, it, I don't it's see any other way now. that you can pronounce it other than real. Anyway. Yeah. So real said, we all long for a perfect relationship, but real intimacy actually happens when we learn to accept the imperfections of our partner. That's the character of couplehood. He said, you're clear about your partner's imperfections and you feel the pain and, fr clear. and, and frustration clear. of it, uh -huh. but you choose to lose. Uh, sorry. That was for Dan. <laughs> you choose to divorce them. Well, I mean, marry them. I was going to say, but you choose to lose them anyway. But the, the, the line in the article says, but you choose to love them anyway. <laughs> That's mature love. That's mature love guys. Um, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, some of the parts I don't disagree with. Right. That, you know? No, I, I, okay. So I totally agree with yeah. that you're clear on your partner's imperfections and yeah. you feel the pain and frustration of it, but you choose to lo uh, love them anyway. I, I I agree with that. It's not, I wouldn't even have put the anyway in there. The anyway is kind of cunty. Yeah. Yeah. 
You know? Yeah, and and, and now you But know, you love them any like you love them despite all those. So things. so I said earlier with my last relationship, like I, I left because I hated him. I did I didn't I do want to be clear because I do want to be more um considerate with my words. I never hated him. But I when I when I like did all the thing like most of the things that this author is talking about in the article, I found myself having to do those things and I was like, This isn't the relationship I want at all. Right. This person isn't good for me. This is, we're not a match anymore. We're not compatible. We're not a match anymore. Yeah. We were a match for a long time and now we're not a match and that's okay. So yeah, but I, I, hmm. I do agree. Like I'm trying to think of an imperfect, like you're accepting your partner's imperfections and like loving them despite it. I'm like, what is an imperfection that's so bad? Like that you can't fix. Well, I mean, but also it's like in the or work cor- on maybe. in the course of our lifetime, we're not going to fix all the imperfections that we have. No, it's true. And I, I got yeah. And I think some imperfections in our partners are ones that bother us as the partner more than they bother the person themselves. And it's, mm. I think it's, it's. I mean, it's really loving to try and work on something about yourself that like really doesn't bother you at all and bother someone else. Yeah, yeah. But if someone, if someone expressed that, so I feel like. S- if it was like the way I did something, even if it was not sexual, I'd be like, all right, if that bugs you, I don't really care about it. Like yeah, I, it I can totally what it see is. Yeah. I can totally see it. But like, yeah, I think there is a, I don't know. This is a really good conversation that we have. I'm excited for. Yeah, for yeah. Me. The author is great. And yeah, I, I just thought this was, because I, I I could tell that the woman that we interviewed today from how she wrote about this article, this article really but really bothered her. Yeah, and, and I get why. I can see. I can see why. You know, and you're about to see why when you hear how <laughs> gloriously joyful this person is. Yeah, okay. yeah. So she has a PhD from Harvard University. She's the author of Single at Heart: The Power, Freedom, and Heart Filling Joy of Single Life. Her TED Talk, What No One Ever Told You About People Who Are Single, has been viewed almost two million times. And the Atlantic calls this woman America's foremost thinker and writer on the single experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to Guys We Fucked, Dr. Dr. Bella DePaulo. DePaulo. 